So what is the Radiant Garden City Beautiful? Is it a thing? No, it's not really a thing. It's four things. It's at least four things. This comes from Jane Jacobs, who said, uh, remember Jane Jacobs? What is the principle she's famous for? We talked about it last week. We read about it this week. Okay, who's Janie's buddy? What? What? Don't no, it's too late. You're the one in trouble. How does that make you feel, Jenny? You got her in trouble. Sorry. Right, get Jenny a chair. At least do that much. Okay, all right. Yes. She, she's the one, the eyes on the streets lady. She's the woman who no one saw coming because she was just a secretary at a magazine. And all of a sudden she's writing articles and all of a sudden she's taking on the most powerful design force in the United States of America in the 60s and she is kicking his butt. And she saved... New York, Central Park, Washington Square Park, 42nd Street. He saved New York from having been cut up by urban freeways the way uh, Boston was cut up with urban freeways. Boston was cut up with the central artery. You don't know what that is because it was rebuilt and buried underground uh, before you were born, right? I feel so old. Uh, but you do know what the Southwest uh, Southwest Corridor is, right? What's the Southwest Corridor? It's in the I-90. It's the, uh, it's the orange line. Do you notice that kind of trough that the orange, who, who's ever ridden the orange line? Right, so you notice this kind of trough and this kind of corridor that cuts through Wentworth Campus, basically? It's right there. There it is. I can see it out the window. That was a vibrant neighborhood of poor black people, and thus the perfect location for an urban freeway, according to the rules of American city design. They, so they demolished, they bulldozed, and displaced tens of thousands of people uh, in this neighborhood, and so that they could make a freeway through this neighborhood. Um, then what happened? Well, Jane Jacobs wasn't here, but my friend Ken Kirkemeyer was here, and he organized a group of people, and he said, uh, no, basically, we're not going to allow this to happen. And that group stopped the freeway from going in. As a, a, as a consolation prize, instead of taking the streetcar line, uh, between downtown Boston to Dudley Square and saying, let's upgrade the streetcar to make it heavy rail, like the Orange Line. That's very expensive for us to uh, dig a tunnel through this vibrant neighborhood. Uh, Dudley Square was like one of the most important centers of black American culture uh, after Harlem and the south side of Chicago. Uh, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, very, very important uh, leaders in the civil rights movement. This was the hotbed of a lot of that work that they were doing. Uh, instead of connecting those communities very well with the urban system of Boston, it was much cheaper to put the orange line in this ditch that was already dug for the freeway. And so that's what they did. So d how do you get to Dudley Square now? You have to get on a bus. Sorry. Bus is not as good. So um, Jane Jacobs is kind of the central figure in this uh, David and Goliath uh, mythology of 20th century America. And she, she, her movement really has repercussions throughout uh, the country and the world, as uh, we might see if we get to it at the end of this lecture. It's not quite fully cooked. I, completely revised this lecture for today. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Um, 
But she, in her 1961 book, what was it called? The Death, the death, and, life of great American the death and Life of Great American Cities, 1961, Jane Jacobs, one of the two most important books ever written in the 20th century on cities. And she was just this mild-mannered human, took on superhuman proportions. Uh, she was very critical of all of these ideas that contributed to the highway madness of mid-century uh, America. And she ridiculed these, the whole profession of planning. She said, planning, you guys are a bunch of bullies and losers and we're not going to take any more. You think these ideas that you have accumulated over the last hundred years are good ideas, but really uh, it's they've risen to the top because there really aren't a lot of ideas. And I'm going to add this next part. This is not Jane Jacobs speaking. This is a lot of us in architecture, in part because architecture split in half. And they said, OK, we used to do cities and buildings. Yeah, we're just going to do buildings now. We're going to split off the, the city design part to someone else. And so they said, OK, we're going to be planning and urban design. But then the urban design part of that kind of shrilled up, uh, broke off, and died. And the planning part kept going. The planning part uh, said, you know what? Design is, we're, we're more about government policy, economic development modeling, and community organization. We'll do that. So if you want to get a degree, if you're interested in all this stuff, there's really no school in North America for you to go to because the planning schools have all been uh, diverted by the accreditation process of planning that eliminates the design part. So what do you do if you want to pick up these issues and carry it forward? Well, one thing you could do is wait a decade and maybe by then Wentworth will have taken up my proposal and develop a post-professional degree in Masters of Urbanism that would be an extension of this course into a, a one year long, 12 month, three semester graduate program to give you a, a Masters of Urbanism. Who's interested? Okay, just a market survey. Um, okay, I'll add that to my database. And, uh, but uh, it turns out uh, that there are really no schools in North America that do this well. The new school of social research in New York is trying. They have a, they have a, a, a odd structure, but they're trying to do this. And some friends of mine are, are doing a good job there. Then there's Harvard that has a Master's of Architecture and Urban Design. Eh. It's kind of just architecture made big. And Architecture made big doesn't work, and we can get into that later. You have to deal with all the issues that we're dealing with in this course. Big architecture does not a good city make. Then there's MIT. What's up, MIT? They kind of almost had a program, but then Diane Davis left and went to Harvard, and they never filled her position. They're kind of just dropping the ball. The best thing they have is this new thing, Center for Advanced Urbanism, uh, which is the sponsor of this competition. So they have some ideas. There's some good people there. A lot of them are friends and colleagues of mine. But uh, there's, no, there, there's, no, there's no educational program. There's no degree program. So what do people like us do who want to dig into these issues of architecture in relation to uh, urban systems and cultural change? Right? What do we do? Yeah, let's do that. Um, but a lot of people go to MIT and they get two degrees. They get a Master's of City Planning and a Master's of Architecture. And they do that at the same time. And instead of doing it in two and a half years, it takes them three and a half years, but that's what they do. So there's a whole group of people who are improvising to get at these issues, to prepare to engage the world effectively to solve these problems. 
but so far they have to improvise uh, if they're going to MIT or Harvard, which really are the best two programs, best position to do this. But after years of pushing MIT and saying, MIT, come on, we're the ones to do it, they just basically very convincingly said, eh, we're not interested, we can't really do it, too many politics. The, uh, the drama queens that teach at MIT won't allow it to happen, and I'm very convinced now, okay, we'll take it, and let's try to do it at Wentworth, right? So that's kind of where we are. When people ask me, where do I go to graduate school for my next degree if I want to do this stuff, I say, go to London, the Bartlett School. Go to Delft, the Netherlands, the Delft, uh, the Technical University of Delft, or, or the Berlach School. Uh, you might have a chance there. Or uh, the University in Barcelona. Those are three schools that do this well, and that's it. Nobody in the United States, even though a few people are trying. So this, is, this title does two things. It both embraces Jane Jacobs' critique of these weak models that came out of this dysfunctional situation, the split between architecture and planning, is a structural dysfunction. You cannot uh, have good outcomes when you remove physical design away from large-scale planning. Basically, the people who have jumped into the void to fill that gap are the transportation planners. And when we say the words transportation planners, we don't mean transportation. We mean automobile dependency. That's a model that was uh, solidified in the schools of planning in the United States and exported all over the world so that there is no other education available to design professionals. If you want to go into planning, then you're going to basically turn into highway engineers. That's kind of what the only physical planning that's operative right now. And we have to do something to fill in those gaps. So here we go. A lot of topics. We're not going to get to them all. Some of them are familiar. Some of them are topics that we talked about last summer. And if you thought it wasn't going to come up again, you were wrong. Here it is. So let's see what you know. Let's see what you remember from last summer. Yeah. You talked about the three magnets. Yes, we'll get to that. Don't say it yet. Let's look at some slides. So the core question in all of this is how do different scales of human experience work differently? If we look through these topics, what we see is it splits between really large scale things and really small scale things. So Jane Jacobs and these others are dealing with really small scale things. What is the human experience? And this is something that's very familiar and comfortable to us, because this is what we do in architecture, right? We design for human experience. That's a new thing in architecture, as I've mentioned previously, but that's what you're doing in this school. And we're really good at that, designing for small experiences. So these are where we're talking about design for, for human scale experiences. And we're trying to balance that with design for large-scale experiences. What's Hitler doing in there? Why are we studying Hitler? Remember that? Mm -hmm. So, visual axes, Rome and Paris. We don't even have to do this because you already have this, right? Let's just remind ourselves. Remember Serlio's uh, stage? Do you have your notes from last summer? Do you remember? Yeah, so this is the stage upon which the drama of human life unfolds. Mm -hmm. And that's what designers do. We create the buildings that are good buildings, right? But they're not just good buildings. And actually, some would argue that the most important outcome of good buildings are not the experience of the good building itself, 
but the collective outcome of multiple good buildings in ensemble, you know, to all together. Their collective impact is far more important than any of the individual impacts. So every time you design a building, for example, let's look at the building across the street. It's a great building, right? It's a pretty good building, right? It's a reasonable, reasonably competent building. And how do we know? Well, we judge it in at least two distinct ways. We walk into it and we have a human experience of the building. It's a good place to take class. I hope we have this class in there someday. Um, it's, it works really well on the inside. But it also uh, contributes to the streetscape. There was a tennis court there. Do you remember that? That was like a big hole in the streetscape of Parker Street. Now, the streetscape of Parker Street is complete. It's a more complete street wall. And instead of the dead facade of Watson Auditorium, which if you're walking past it at night, right, what happens is you're walking down the street and then you, you're walking by Watson Auditorium. What happens? What just happened to my body language? And what am I, what am I reaching in my pocket for? Your wallet and keys. And hmm? Your wallet and keys and shit. I'm a woman. Sorry, I should have said that. Spray. Yes, exactly. Points. I'm reaching for my pepper spray because my parents love me. They are concerned as a young woman in the big bad city, not the greatest neighborhood in the world. Uh, they want me to be safe, so they bought me pepper spray. They registered it with the local police department, and I carry it with me because I love my parents. I know they care about me. And when I'm walking down the street and there's no windows on the facade or there's a parking lot, Right? which is exactly what we have out here on Parker Street. I, 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 I'm sensing, because I'm not stupid, I've, I'm aware of how the world works, right? It's a dangerous place for a young woman. And so I reach for the pepper spray. So Watson Hall, the parking lot, fails the pepper spray test. Have you heard about the pepper spray test? Mm -hmm. Did I tell you about it? Yeah. Oh, good. So the pepper spray test is, does the human experience trigger you to uh, take defensive measures? And then what happens is I pass by Watson Hall, and now I get to the new, whatever the acronym is, the new engineering building, because we're not allowed to use it. What happens? I, I feel safe now. Why do I feel safe in front of that new engineering building? Because uh, it adds life in that area. How does it add life? Lights. Lights? Glass. Modern style. Modern style? The bigger sidewalk. Bigger sidewalk, that's part of it. It's open. It's open. Brings you off the street. Brings you off the street because it's a wider sidewalk. People that you know are in there. Or people you know are in there. I know people in Watson Hall. <coughs> You're close. The glass. The, transparent. the, the mm -hmm. transparency of the glass. This is, so the openness of the facade suddenly makes me feel more safe. This is Eyes on the Street. This is Jane Jacobs. This is Serlio. So the two ends of this topic are being connected. Serlio is saying that every building contributes to the sum total of the urban experience of this. And uh, we use this image to make the point that as great as the individual buildings might be, the much more important impact of our architectural design is how they work in conjunction with each other. What spaces do they form? So every time you design a building, you're actually designing two buildings. You're designing the building for its own purposes and satisfying the needs of the client and collecting your fee. But then the bigger uh, client group are people who you will never meet and will never pay you a penny. It's, and you have to have empathy for them as well. It's the uh, thousands of people who will walk by your building every year 
and whose lives will either be enhanced or threatened by the impact of your building. Does that make sense? And so the design of urban spaces, and I'm going to use the term urban room, outdoor rooms, outdoor rooms. So yes, there's architecture inside each of these buildings, but the main purpose of these buildings are to produce this room, this outdoor room uh, as a public space, this outdoor room in front of the Vatican in Rome. Remember that? So these large visual axes are things that we've been working with since, you know, for over a thousand years. That the pilgrimage, remember the pilgrimage to Rome? If you're a cat, who's Catholic? Who is raised Catholic? You don't have to be Catholic. Okay. So do you know what indulgences are? This is like something you don't need, but you like take it as? That is what indulgences are. So, Yes. But in the Catholic Church, in the history of the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church has this thing called purgatory, which is where you go and it's like a waiting room uh, between Judgment Day, you go to heaven or hell. And if you want to decrease the time you spend in purgatory, you can donate uh, a lot of money to the Catholic Church. That's why the Vatican is so opulent. Uh, they funded that through the donations. Um, or you can go on pilgrimage. And so, and if you walk, you get more indulgences. You get a bigger discount off your time in purgatory. If you crawl on your hands and knees, you get extra bonus points. So you can get thousands of years taken off your time in purgatory. The marketing ploy of this is they don't tell you what the total amount of time is you're deducting from. So there's no end to how much money and how much crawling on your knees um, you're supposed to do. And it was big business. It was the original tourist uh, economic development plan. Come to Rome, visit the key pilgrimage sites, and get your indulgences. Uh, you get your time off purgatory. So they would have jubilee years where they would have double your points, uh, festivals to bring bigger and bigger crowds to Rome. And then they redesigned Rome to allow visual connections between the key monuments of Rome. Do you remember this? It's kind of cool, I think. And so this thing about visual axes really was invented by the Catholic Church in Rome. Even they didn't invent it. It was a continuation of other things. But it just makes sense. And this is connected back to human experience. Right? When, we, when we're walking down the street, again, you know, again, I'm, I'm doing this human experience mime routine. Walking down the street, and I get to, um, what's a good example in, uh, well, I guess you can, can you see Trinity Church down Huntington Avenue? No. Boylston, what street am I thinking No, but you can see the Hancock, the John Hancock, and that's sort of. Well, let's, let's do this. Let's go to Versailles. I'm Boylston, right? Yeah, so, so let's, let's go to Washington, D.C., right? Or Paris, walking down the street. I'm in the crosswalk, I'm walking, and I, I just glance up and it's like, what's that? Three miles away, or we're in Paris. Uh, six kilometers away, five kilometers away. This, uh, it's the Arc de Triomphe. I can see it down this axial view. That's power. That's, so my human experience is a human experience of power. The Palace at Versailles, uh, outside of Paris, is a machine for demonstrating power. Louis XIV said, I need to demonstrate my power. And so I'm going to use, so who are you going to call? You need to demonstrate your power, who are you going to call? Yes. Architects. And you say you're architects, I need a demonstration of my power. I need to maintain control over my people. What do you got for me? And the architect says, well, there's this trick we did back in Rome uh, under Sixtus V uh, about uh, 700 years ago. 
we got one of those for you. Would you like one of those? And he said, yes, I'll take three of them, right? I'll have it at Versailles and let's do it all over Paris. And then let's do it in the colonies, the French colonies. So for the next several hundred years, this was all the rage. Demonstrations of power. Remember this? Demonstrations of power. But this is another human experience. Demonstrations of wealth and opulence. I go shopping on the streets of the new bourgeois Paris that was rebuilt for me with axial views to uh, all the monuments. Remember uh, Charles Garnier's Opera House? I bet we're going to see that soon. And I go to the shopping, I go to the shopping mall, Bon Marche, the first modern shopping mall. And I go there to promenade, to see others and to be seen by others. I buy luxury goods, and then I go to the opera. And there might be some singing on a stage somewhere, but I don't really care. What I'm really doing is I'm strolling through the streets in my finest uh, costume with my husband on my arm. Again, I'm a woman because I have empathy for all users of the city and all users of architecture. Uh, so it's important to stretch your imagination and place yourself in the point of view of people who you would normally have no access to. Like, I don't know. I, who am I? I have no idea what it's like to be a wealthy woman in Paris. Well, it's your job to know what it would be like to be a wealthy woman in Paris and a child growing up in Dorchester. So here we are parading. The architecture is a machine for demonstrating my status in society and for establishing my status in society. Remember all this? Houseman was doing infrastructure improvements of the water supply and the sewer system, but he was also uh, doing rapid troop, you know, allowing rapid troop movement through uh, Paris. Who's looking at the slide and who's working on something else? I think we need to look at the slides. What are all these laptops? Are you taking notes? Let's close that. Let's close that. Champs-Élysées Street is in Paris, right? Champs-Élysées. It's right there. Champs-Élysées is right here. And it connects to uh, Shanghai because they're, they said, we're going to make a Champs-Élysées. We call it Century Boulevard in Pudong. Let's make it one meter wider than the Champs-Élysées. Ha, got down. And we're going to see it in Berlin, Hitler's Berlin. One meter wider than the Champs-Élysées? No, we're going to go 20 meters wider in Hitler's Berlin. Um, so widen the streets to demonstrate power and to move troops and for big military parades. Choose where you locate these boulevards as a tool for eliminating the poor people out of the city. We were doing that in the United States uh, up until, well, we still do it. We just don't use, we did it um, very openly as a strategy for urban development. We plowed our freeways through poor neighborhoods um, as a strategy for gentrification. We create new, part, new uh, train stations. Gare du Nord, uh, where, there it is. All the train stations would come in, but not all the way into the core of the city because it was too expensive to get all that land. Uh, new parks, again for strolling. The annexation of towns around. And a, it's a way to put monumental architecture at the key intersections to demonstrate power. Infrastructure, defensive strategies, slum, breaking up the slums, erasing the old fabric and replacing it with new fabric. Remember this one? This, this is our favorite, right? We love this. The servants, the rich people, on the Piano Nobile, which is up above the street level. We call that the first floor in the rest of the world. And 
at Wentworth, we call this the first floor. That six-story building over there, we number it so we pretend it's four stories high at Beatty Hall. And then the middle, you know, the, in the middle, not as wealth as the wealthy. This guy, poor guy, he just got home because he's a working stiff. He's probably a college professor. Uh, greeting the kids, he's been working late. And then the very poor renters, and then the artists, and uh, creative bohemian class, all in one building. Interesting architectural How solution. How artists be put at top of their, like, work is being shown so well around this time period? Well, the top is good now, right? Because good views. But no, back but then... That, even back then, why are the artists put up there? Because that's the time when art was big and popular. Oh, when you make it big, then you end up here. So you work your way from starving artist status to... Okay. Uh, struggling artist status to I uh, made it. So the one in 10,000 artists, you go there, the, the rest are stuck up here, and then about three end up in the middle. Partial success. And it was cold in the winter, and it was hot in the summer, and it was a long ways up. So not the preferred position. And here we are strolling uh, as a demonstration of our status. And it transformed Paris. And the monuments located at the ends of these axes, we looked a lot at the, uh, the Paris Opera as an architectural instrument for establishing power and class. And it's a giant machine. Uh, this is where the audience is. It's, arguably the smallest part of the, the section. And you have the spectacle backstage. This is where the spectacle, this is uh, the Imagineering, the Disney Imagineering. This is where you uh, sound and light, George Lucas sounded. This is like the movie industry that produces monumental spectacle. Uh, and then this is the parade ground for the wealthy to demonstrate. And so it's interesting to see that distribution. When Philip Johnson in the 20th century designed Lincoln Center in New York, this was about the proportion of the Opera House. You had all this space in the lobby and all these walkways on multiple levels to you know, parade during intermission, before and after. There are restaurants and bars now. Um, so Lincoln Center is a continuation of these ideas. Remember that? That was a good class. And then we extended it to the French colonies. We, here we are in Casablanca, Morocco. The French ideas, some of them went from Paris to the colonies. Some of them went to the colonies and were tested there first before being implemented in Paris. And so, uh, and these ideas spread from Paris to Vienna. Um, here we are back in Casablanca. And here we are in Hanoi, Vietnam. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And so some of these ideas were tested out in the colonies uh, with really interesting outcomes. This is a French building uh, hybridized with Vietnamese uh, cultural uh, artifacts. And the most amazing demonstration of this approach is Thailand. Amazing. OK, enough of that. On to another familiar category, topic. Remember the Chicago World's Columbian Ex Exposition of 1893? Uh, this was where the, the visual axes of Hausmann's Paris, of S Pope Sixtus V's Rome, came to the United States. And we said, we can do that. It had such a major impact on the cultural uh, attitudes of the United States that it is credited as being the, the spark of what was called the American Renaissance. Someday, people will talk about Hunt and Richardson, Lafarge and Saint-Gaudin, Burnham and McKim, and Stanford White, when their politicians and millionaires were quite forgotten. So these guys are the architects, Hunt, Richardson, Burnham, McKim, and White. 
Uh, this was the moment of the rise of American greatness out of the shadows of their European former colonizers. Now they are, they're all grown up now and ready to take on the world. And the Chicago, the plan of Chicago grew out of the World Columbian Exposition. So Daniel Burnham said, let's make, let's Hausmanize Chicago. And so he proposes these diagonal boulevards cutting through the uh, block grid of Chicago. Monumental buildings at the core uh, and a demonstration of a civic attitude in Chicago that uh, gets implemented most, one of the most, the clearest uh, demonstrations of this was in Washington, D.C. Uh, several iterations of the uh, the plans for a city beauty. So when it when this these ideas came from Paris, Rome, uh, Ven um, Vienna to the United States, it took on this name, the City Beautiful Movement. And Burnham uh, was involved in Washington D.C. and he was involved in San Francisco, and he was involved in Manila the Philippines, uh, and other places around the world. He was called in to produce these uh, demonstrations of power. This is Cleveland, um, where they did a very, very beautiful job. And this is um, the kind of uh, an analysis. Right? There's a quality here that um, is really kind of, uh, all of a sudden, you're not distracted by the mismatch between the actual factual reality of the place and the overlay. It's almost like someone uh, spray painted these buildings and then took a photo of it. It's a really powerful thing. So now you can really look at what's going on. Of These buildings are the civic infrastructure of Cleveland framing this, uh, this civic space uh, that looks out on Lake Mm -hmm. um, and really a source of pride if you're from Cleveland. Who's from Cleveland? My co-op was from Cleveland. Oh, yeah? Yeah, to overlook Lake Erie is actually not much of a compliment anymore. Well, it's better than it was when it was catching fire. Did you hear those stories? Yeah, I heard all those stories. Yeah. Well, now what's over here? We have a stadium and a rock oh, and roll hall of fame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, messed it up a little. Washington, D.C. An interesting approach there, but not as effective as the, the Cleveland run, right? Which do you like better, this one or this, that one? This one. I prefer the Washington. Washington. Oh, really? You like that? From, from actually being there, I feel like you have to have an up-close experience with both places, not just by looking at that image, and it does change your motive. Yeah, it does change your experience. I think this is a little too loose. New Delhi, India, was transformed to be the capital of British India according to these principles. Where is this? I don't even know. So this, this approach is saying, it's really the facades that are framing this space. Boy, it sure looks like Washington, D.C., but it's not Washington, D.C. But it's the facades that are, framed, are doing the job. So let's just highlight the facades. What do you think of that? Is that effective? Yeah, I'm not so sure. I don't think it's that effective. But it's a very powerful, high-resolution image that you can zoom in on and really grab stuff. OK, next topic. To the reading. So Ebenezer Howard, again, we, we keep running into these important people who were not trained as architects, who have uh, incredible impact on our ideas. Ebenezer Howard is one of those. And the, the big problems of the world when he was writing around 1900 
uh, are, are the pollution and the degradation of cities in the early industrial uh, era of the 19th century. So it's really interesting. This is kind of a historical uh, lesson for us. We, and this is one of the advantages of going backwards in time. We talked about how the problems of the 21st century are really the unintended side effects of the remarkable successes of the 20th century. Right? We were so successful in the 20th century um, beyond anyone's wildest dreams. And it, but it had some unintended side effects like death of the species. A big unintended consequence. Right? Climate change is a big unintended side effect. But it's not because we failed, it's because we succeeded so uh, stupendously. Similarly, everything that Ebenezer Howard is saying is a direct, uh, is a direct response to the stupendous successes of the 19th century of industrial transformation of every economy in the world. So that produced uh, a lot of unintended consequences of pollution and destruction and poverty and high overcrowding, and we're going to talk about that next week. But in the face of all those problems that are, were the unintended side effects of the successes of the Industrial Revolution, Ebenezer Howard says, Let's take the best of the city and the best of the country and bring them together in a garden city. And what he is proposing, what he produces is a diagram. So this is not a, a proof of concept. This is a, a cartoon version of something we should try. And it's not very convincing. He's appealing to our, our he's using abstract ideas to appeal to our imaginations. He's not demonstrating the success of this. He's not an architect, right? So he just makes appealing diagrams. So this gets to that conversation we have about the uh, diagrams are extremely useful, but they don't substitute for evidence. They're not evidence. Uh, they are used to appeal to our imaginations and similarly, they are used to deceive us. And we can't, how do we verify? We can, we can look for the internal logical consistency of the diagram, but we, this is not evidence of success. Right? Um, so we looked at this, and we read about it. The demonstration is here in Letchworth where Ebenezer Howard was still alive. He was advising, um, and he was saying, uh, yeah, let's take this and let's put in, impose these ideas on the actual, let's try out these ideas. So this diagram gets translated into this town. One of the first things that changed is the high population density that justifies calling this a garden city goes way, way down. And so this is not really a garden city. It's a garden suburb or garden city suburb. The garden city idea, but at a density that's much, much lower. And so here are the ideas. They're using the visual axes of the Haussmann, the City Beautiful, the Paris, the Rome, the Vienna. Uh, to kind of create a sense of civic identity uh, and that power. They're also using it to bring us to the train station, which takes us to London, to and from London, because there's not really any employment here. That was another thing that gets transformed in going from the diagram to the implementation, is that it's not, the, the landscape is not filled with industrial production. It is surrounded by a green belt. The green belt idea, see that green belt? That's an idea from the Garden City diagram. 
Yeah, maybe it's the other. But we also recognize the green belt idea in this geometry because we looked very quickly at the planning ideas around Jakarta, Indonesia, where the Dutch came in and they said, you certainly don't want to allow Jakarta to just explode in a sprawl model. And the British would tell you, oh, you need to make a green belt and then make satellite garden cities, suburbs. And the Dutch said, well, you don't want to do that because you can't control, you don't have the land use regulations in place to control where people build and where people uh, don't build. So you don't want to do this, right? The green belt thing is just not going to work. Uh, and so that was a demonstration, again, an advantage of doing this class in reverse chronological order. We s we're we looking back at, in time at the ideas that are still in play in design professional models of what to do. So the green belt idea, um, so here we go into Letchworth. The two examples we're going to look at are Letchworth and Radburn. Uh, Letchworth, very briefly, just this one slide. Um, it's still there, and there's this interesting arrangement where you put the houses uh, along the street, and you do something very inefficient from a land uh, commodification point of view, right? You don't have a uniform grid. Like, remember the grid of Manhattan, and we remember the Jeffersonian grid across the country? That was to parcelize land into identical plots. So you could sell it quickly. You could sell hundreds of them quickly, without ever seeing them, because every plot is identical to every other plot, at least in the abstract, at least in theory. So you charge the same price for every plot. But here, we don't have that. Every plot is different. The depth is different. And um, the private ownership ends, and then there's a collective ownership in the center of the block. Wait a minute. That's not what capitalism would have you do. What's going on here? So this is a social norm that is deemed to be beneficial, that we have access to the best of both worlds. We can go to the street and um, say hi to our neighbors as we walk to the train station, uh, go into London work, come back, and, and again, say hello to everyone. So we have access to the city on the street face, and we have access to this open space, the country, or uh, a shrunken version of the wilderness in mid-block. Very interesting approach. Not the most, not the easiest way to make a fortune in the land development business unless you can capture the market interest and offer people more than what everybody else is doing. At the same time, uh, Let's now go from England to the United States. There's a lot of interest in, and this actually, these ideas come out of the Chicago Plan movement. They say, um, sure, have your radial streets and have your major important centers, but let's look at what happens between those major visual axes. Let's look at the human experience of the neighborhoods. And instead of saying the center of the neighborhood, is the church or the train station or the civic center. Let's say the center of, let's stop being so male about it. Let's be more feminine. Let's say that the center of our world is the children. And they, so Clarence Stein and his collaborators are saying, what if the most important indication of success and failure is having, is is access through the viewpoint of the child. What is it like to be a nine-year-old girl? So the nine-year-old girl becomes the indicator species of success and failure in architecture uh, that produces this approach of the neighborhood unit. And so the key is what is it like to be the parent of children uh, in this world you center it on the schools, the churches, the civic organizations, 
the main streets that are the visual axes where the husband is going off to work, because back then the husbands went off to work and the women worked at home. Uh, this is the male world. We don't care about the male world. That's easy. There's no pepper spray test. Okay. This is hard. The mothers and the children in 1929. The mothers and the children, that's hard. So instead of centering our conceptions of urban design and architecture on the male world of the main visual corridors, this power axis, let's test it through the viewpoint of the child and the stay-at-home mother. And in order to, to succeed by those criteria and that test, you have to limit the, the size of the world. And the crucial thing is, what is the relationship between the kindergarten, the nursery school, the elementary school, the middle school, the high school, and the home? And so the test becomes, um, how do children go to school? So the epitome of this testing is Radburn, New Jersey, 1929. Uh, this is I think the most successful garden suburb design approach uh, that we have to look at. Uh, and this is, I'm sorry it's so low resolution, but we have a student who took the diagram of the Garden City suburb in its architectural scale of one cul-de-sac, where on one side of every house there is a driveway and a car and a sidewalk and access to the train station and the world, the city side, and then there's the countryside. So what we're, we're doing here is we're relating it directly back to the diagram of Ebenezer Howard. We're using his terms and we're saying, this house, this suburban house, is the best of both worlds, the best of the city and the country. The city side is on this side of the house. The countryside is on this side of the house. The house is the architectural mediator between the city and the country. And the father leaves and goes into his male world of the city, while the mother and the children, the kitchen is overlooking the backyard, uh, the children leave and independently walk to the school without danger, without ever having to cross the street. And if the children uh, have to cross the street to get to the school that's over here, you give them an underpass. It's basically treating them as if they are wildlife the way we treat wildlife now, right? We don't like it when uh, we hit a moose when we're driving in Maine. Who likes hitting a moose? Uh, we like seeing moose, but we don't like hitting a moose, right? Who's, who's, seen, who's been terrified by a moose in Maine or a deer? Right? It's no fun. So what we do is we put wildlife corridors under our freeways so the deer are not trying to cross the freeway, so the moose are not trying to cross it. So this was the approach taken for children. Does that make sense? And so here it is when it was first produced. And you see every house is the mediation point between the male world of the city, the female world of the countryside, and it gives them access to the school, which I don't think has been built yet. Do you see a school there? <clears throat> Maybe it's gonna go here. Oh yeah, this is the same place. Right? This is the one that was mapped. Here it is, higher resolution. So they took the map and it exactly it was built exactly as drawn. And so you can superimpose the map. It'd be better if it was transparent, don't you think? Yeah. Um, and and it, it's the connective tissue. All these houses have a, a city side and a countryside that leads them to the school. And there's this one, which is the backdrop to this whole thing. Uh, it's a much more subtle an analysis where the colors, so the streets are done in, in red and the, the pedestrian paths are done in yellow 
And we even have some crosswalk action going on here. So this is a very effective analysis, where the green is, is, is highlighted, the school is highlighted, it's subtle. And this is an interesting one, too. This student said, what if this, so this is our familiar, this isn't done as well as we would like it. So this is the, the successful 1929 Garden City suburb that connects us people to the school, but then after, so what happened in 1929 when this was built? Right? They shut down, the economy shut down in 1929, the Great Depression. So no building for several decades until after World War II, and they pick up the ball, this was all empty land until after World War II, and they said, okay, let's keep building. If they were to continue building this model, it would look something like this. Right? There'd be these these uh, green areas in the center of the block and the street grid would accommodate that. But they said, nope, we're done. Plain old lots with zero interior, uh, you know, this, they don't do the finger thing anymore of the city and the country kind of intertwined like, like this is. They said, nope, city, country, nope, get rid of the country. It's just fences around the, the rear, yards of the of the each individual parcel there's no place for the children to there's no countryside does that make sense so Corbusier so this is the one I want to fly through because we've done this we looked at Tony Garnier's uh, Rome Prize uh, proposal that was the um, the invention of functional zoning. Because of the successes of the Industrial Revolution, you have factories all over the place. Industrial zoning says you keep the factories outside of town away from residential neighborhoods. You keep residential neighborhoods away from the center of town, and you put distance between these different activities. Thank you very much, uh, Tony Garnier, um, if you go back, if you invent a time machine, go back and kill Hitler, and then go back and kill Tony Garnier. Because functional zoning is the single biggest obstacle to producing good urbanism that you will encounter during your careers. We all know that zoning, functional zoning, uh, was born of the evil intent of race segregation in the United States. Uh, and has had unintended, very negative consequences of creating automobile dependency because if you can't have commercial uh, uses anywhere near residential uh, neighborhoods, then uh, you end up with the state of Florida where if uh, on average people take 19 trips a day. If you want to go to work, you got to drive. If you want to uh, go to the movies, you got to drive. If you want to go get a quart of milk, you got to drive. If you want your children to go to school, you got to drive them to school. Nobody can walk anywhere because in part of functional segregation due to zoning. Um, remember the Ray Don uh, plan? This is one of my favorite things because after Hausman, there was Ennard, and Ennard was this had this really cool idea of uh, the, the square tooth plan. There's a lot of efficiency for creating big buildings with long corridor um, on the Beaux-Arts model of planning. But the streetscape suffers if you have big, long facades. Let's break up those big, long facades and make it feel, look and feel like separate uh, buildings they're where you go garden, building, garden, building, garden, building, and at a rapid pace of maybe 20 meters uh, at a time. And so, but, so you have the best of both worlds. You have this positive experience uh, of the axial, positive human experience, again, human experience of these long visual corridors but you have all the modern efficiencies of large footprint Beaux-Arts planning buildings. Brilliant. 
uh, Corbusier had tons of brilliant ideas that he invented. But what people neglect to realize is Corbusier was also the master of, of looking at the world and recognizing brilliant ideas when he sees them. He was traveling through Italy. Remember this? It was the monastery that he stopped. He said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm going to stop and I'm going to look at this. This is very similar to what we saw in Radburn. Except on the human side, the city side, there's a cloister of the monastery. And on the nature side, there are these grand views across the valley. So grand views across the valley and inside. So countryside, city. The, and by city, what we mean is opportunities to engage with other humans, right? The social, the social engagement side. And so he took this idea of the monastery and he studied the monk's cell. And remember we did this last summer, the DNA of the monk's cell is so deeply embedded in Corbusier's consciousness that he spends the next uh, decades reproducing it in his housing ideas. So here we have the monk's cell reinterpreted as his Esprit de Nouveau pavilion that was intended to be mass produced, stacked up, and replicated by the tens of thousands. And uh, Sichuan was a play on the words of the Sichuan car company that was interested in mass producing housing the way they were mass producing cars. Also, one of the most important uh, initiators of the um, parametric software you use now. The mathematics for the software you use also came out of this automobile company. So here we see that housing model interpreted from the monastery produced as a single unit here and then what's the logic of agglomeration? And this is something you're going to be dealing with what semester are you in? You're in semester six. You're Studio Six? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you did this already last semester. You did your housing agglomeration. What's the individual unit? And what's the logic of the agglomeration of the unit? I hope this helped, having studied it last summer. I don't know if anyone made that connection. And so here they are. These are those housing agglomerations. And he's using Enard's Redon uh, square tooth plan ideas in combination with big towers. So we did all this. Ville Radius, this is the radiant city of the garden, radiant, radiant garden city beautiful uh, that Jane Jacobs was so critical of. Um, Unité d'habitation, this is the one most directly related to what you were doing last semester in the housing studio. I don't know, did anyone do a skip stop elevator plan? Next time. So unfortunately, this is the part of the lecture I did not uh, develop more fully. But for better or worse, I don't really have to. Because the world you see is the outcome of the world that grew out of Corbusier's ideas. The Futurama city that we looked at last week, it's not so different from where we live. This is the predecessor to the Futurama vision of, of the 20th century. This was happening in the 20s. Uh, it was totally alien at that point. We look at this and we say, so what? Right? Because it's totally normal. I look out the window past you, and I see these buildings, more or less. I look out that window and I see these buildings more or less, right? It's, it's boring because it's so normal. But in 1922, this was Star Wars stuff. This was like, what? Right? Imagine the, the city, the way it looked like in the 20s. And then you see this insane Swiss guy coming in and says this. You say, you're insane. This guy should be put away, right? But then you get Futurama, and all of a sudden, this stuff is the vision of the future according to General Motors, and now it's just, we call it Tuesday. 
you know, this is so normal, it's not even worth talking about. So what happened? Here's what happened. Courbusier is sucking in all these great ideas. He's, he's, like a, he's like a dog that has eaten a bologna sandwich. Do, does anyone have a dog? So what, once your dog eats a bologna sandwich, what is your dog obsessed with from that point forward? A bologna sandwich. It just wants a bologna sandwich. And what does your dog do? Because is that a bologna sandwich? It's like right there, just sniffing everywhere. And if it smells, if it could possibly be a bologna sandwich, they lick the bologna sandwich. And if it could, if it seems like a, they eat it, right? They'll eat anything, right? Corbusier is like a dog looking for a bologna sandwich. He is going to Italy, and he's saying, ooh, these are good ideas. And he goes to, he studies what Einard did. He studies what Hausmann did, and he goes, and then he gets a chance to, because the, uh, his business was not booming. He was a painter, he was an architect, and he was an urban planner. And he's been sucking in all of these brilliant ideas for decades, and he gets to the drawing table, and I don't know if God was speaking through him or what, but what I do know is all of these ideas that he's been taking in all these years, he breathes life into it, and he puts it in an architectural vision. And it's insane, but it's also insanely powerful. And some of the ideas that we're seeing here are the Baroque city visual axis ideas. Do you see those? See the two arches? So here's an airport in the middle. He's saying airport, air travel. The airplane was just invented. Of course, the airplane is the, the airports are the new train stations, so they should go at the center of the city. Didn't work so well, so we moved them out, and then we moved them out further. But he's taking these ideas and he's integrating them into these grand visions. And at first, they're totally rejected. Uh, and then at second, they're rejected some more. But something weird happens. Uh, and by the time we get to 1933, an organization called the uh, CIAM, C-I-A-M, is the only thing you're going to know. Um, but that's a French acronym for the International Congress of Modern Architecture. International Congress of Modern Architecture. Because in France they mix words up. Right? So CIAM is something I told you about last summer, and I want you to put it in your pocket and carry it with you out of this class into your future careers. So Siam started having meetings every year, and they, <clears throat> they said, we gotta come up with some solutions to the world's problems. They were doing the thing that I'm saying you guys should do in, in 2032. They got together every few years and they said, okay, we've got a housing problem, what should we do? And they said, let's design housing units that are fantastic, take advantage of all the best technology, all of our best architectural knowledge, but are smaller. And they called it the minimum existence housing unit. And they competed with each other to come up with basically micro units. They were doing that in the 20, 1927. And when they get to 1933, they say, let's extend the logics of the minimum housing unit to housing blocks and then to the entire city and including transportation things. So basically, everybody at that point is working off of the DNA and the basic elements of Corbusier's speculations of the 1920s. And they're putting it together into their own housing ideas architecturally. And then they're extending it to the urban form, a fabric of the city. They get on a boat in Marseille, and they uh, go across the Mediterranean. And by the time they arrive in Athens, uh, four days later, they have uh, 147 or something like this rules and principles for how to transform the world so that it works in the modern world. But 
it's 1933. We're in the midst of the global economic depression. We don't have the money to do any of this. So what do you do? You fight Hitler in Europe. Uh, you extend the ideas to uh, Rio de Janeiro, uh, Algiers. You propose it for Buenos Aires, New York, and Paris. So you speculate a lot because we're not designing and building much because of the Hitler thing. Um, the Germans are busy saying, listen, whatever the, the form of the city is, forget about that. Let's orient our architecture to the sun. Let's ignore the fabric of the city and orient to solar north south. So, right? This is what you do in Tech One, right? In Software Studio. Turns out to be a horrible idea. Sorry. <clears throat> Just look across the street. Those are Xilinbao. Those are Xilinbao uh, housing projects. Alice Hayward Taylor, where you don't you don't care what the streets doing. The streets are for motor cars. And the space between the street for motor cars and the housing for humans, it's just leftover space. It's whatever is left over. <clears throat> that is the single biggest flaw in the way we design cities in the 20th century. And we can talk about that more. But it's just leftover space. And it's good for nothing except shrubbery and parking lots. And it fails the pepper spray test. So Corbusier's ideas get um, incorporated into this, these ideas of the Athens Charter that once World War II is over and we have this huge industrial machinery that won the war and now we have to rebuild Europe, uh, but how do we do it? It's helpful to, to show up and say, here's a plan. And so that's what happened. The Marshall Plan to reconstruct European cities showed up with the Athens Charter produced by Siam uh, and Corbusier's ideas. Uh, Corbusier was the head of Siam at that point. And they, said, and they published it in 1943, anticipating the end of the war. And they rebuilt European cities according to the principles of the Athens Charter. If Paris had been destroyed, this is likely to have been the outcome of that. This is Notre Dame. This is the Louvre. This is the Marais. Have you been to Paris? This is probably where you were hanging out. This is where the Pompidou Center is. All bulldozed is what they wanted to do and replaced with these towers. So the, the Athens Charter uh, is really the thing that was the blueprint by which European cities were rebuilt, the colonial cities were developed, and the US cities were, uh, what we would do is we'd go to slums where poor black people lived, and we would kick them out and bulldoze it, and then we'd rebuild according to the Athens Charter. That's how this neighborhood was produced. It was Athens Charter, urban renewal. And so when you say, I'm interested in urban renewal, you have to be clear that urban renewal is a historical thing. There's a capital U on urban renewal and a capital R. It might as well be a trademark thing because it is fixed in time. It was a historical moment of extreme racism and extreme destruction. And so I beg of you to come up with a better term than urban renewal. I suggest urban revitalization or urban redevelopment, which is the term that Boston uses, Singapore uses. Here's what happened in New York City. We looked at this. This was my neighborhood in New York. You see the old farming parcels, and then you see the grid of New York and how it allowed the mass production of the architecture. This was uh, before the war, and this is after the war. And this is a project I 
did when I was in architecture school to document this. And then some students last year said, oh, we want to we wanna, uh, use your work as the base for our, so they added all the colors. So let's do a little Hitler, right? He was an architecture student. They didn't let him, he, he was an art student. He wanted to go to architecture school, but he wasn't good enough. So they said no to you. And he said, well, I'll show you. He takes over the country, attempts to take over the world. He designs, he's the designer of the freeway system, the Autobahn. He's the designer of the flag. He's the designer of the Nazi uniform. He's the designer of the Volkswagen bug. Here he is digging the first shovel full to create the freeway system of uh, the German Autobahn. He studied how to use his body uh, to exude power. Right? I'm, I, I study the same thing, but I'm always like, should I walk like this? Or should I walk like this? Right? So I do the same thing. This is, um, this is his plan for Germany after he takes over the world, the largest dome in human history. When he is found dead uh, in the bunker, he's in a bunker and there's a tunnel from the bunker he's in to another uh, bunker where this model, it was his favorite thing, it was his obsession. Some would say one of the, it was an instrument for his ambitions. He was so committed to transforming the world physically that uh, this is what he was doing. He designed these spectacles. These searchlights was not just 9-11. You, you see those searchlights going up to forever. It was Hitler. There's his model. Um, Here it is visualized. This is the interior of that 180,000 person uh, domed stadium. This is from the man in the high castle, which uh, they did their research on Hitler's architectural plans. He was working with the architect Adolf Speer. You can get a sense of the scale of this. Those are humans down there. Anyway. So, um, so, uh, so once we defeated Hitler, we took the team, uh, the, the Siam Athens Charter blueprint for rebuilding the world, and we implemented it uh, as an alternative to what Hitler wanted to do to rebuild the world. Hitler was all about the visual axes. He was, he was making monuments at the end of these long visual axes. Actually, maybe it's worth, um, this one. There's supposed to be sound here. So see the visual axis. You are looking at the central part of the construction project, the north-south axis, an area of around six kilometers with the Great Hall at the top corner of the picture. This new structure would have ripped through Berlin's cityscape. The start at its lower end would have formed the gigantic South Railway Station with a forecourt of 330,000 square meters. This would have been decorated with military equipment captured from defeated nations and a triumphal arch 117 meters high. The adjoining Boulevard of Splendor, which would have been 120 meters wide, 20 was meters wider than the Champs-Élysées, Champs but would have surpassed it in size and decoration. Buildings with facades up to 200 meters in length. So the job of these buildings is to create stone, the boulevard. And would have included around a dozen ministries, administrative buildings for the National Socialist Party, 
as well as representative offices for private companies and cultural institutions. A parade ground was planned north of Tiergarten Park. This is the Reichstag. The if you've been to Berlin, on the you're west going to Berlin. Side, with grotesquely You'll see this rooms. building. It's Although huge. Hitler had already had the pompous new Reich Chancellery built in the historic government district, a new chancellery was planned for this palace, including a gallery over 500 meters in length to fill visitors with awe as they made their way to the head of state. The Reichstag would have been integrated into the eastern edge of the square as an auxiliary building. Designed to be the highest of all and trump the rest, the Great Hall would have been located where you are now standing. The assembly building, based on an idea by Hitler himself, could hold up to 180,000 people and was to be a national socialist cult site and the city crown. Covering an area of around 99,000 square meters, the colossal dome would have been about 300 meters high, making it the largest building of its kind in the world. It's about a hundred stories. As the description of the axis shows, the new buildings of the <clears throat> Reich capital would have served less for actual use, but rather in their overall scale would have sought to create a formidable outward appearance. Power. Hitler's war aims also played a role here. In his delusions of grandeur, he imagined that by 1950, Germany would have risen to be the greater Germanic world empire, and Berlin would be rebuilt to be the world capital. Thus, restructuring plans were essentially driven by Hitler's military policy, as well as his architectural megalomania. And the military policy was the driven by... The large open space surrounding us, the Spreeborgen Park, also brings to mind the most... And so that, that's the, the power part of this. Um, so the part that... Um, is underdeveloped in this version of the lecture is where we look at Team 10. Um, so let me just quickly give you the outline of what we would be looking at here and some hints. Uh, I apologize for not fleshing out these two topics, um, but it is something that you could look into as you look at what to do for Wednesday. So Team 10, uh, it's spelled Team X, but don't say Team X say Team 10. Um, they were the young group, an international group, and they uh, basically displaced Corbusier. Corbusier was the head of Siam, and by the time they got to the 10th meeting of Siam, um, they said, listen, old man, give us a chance. And Corbusier, because this is the kind of guy he was, he said, Yes. He supported them. He empowered them. He said, welcome. Take over. How can I help you? And uh, he supported them in basically uh, replacing Corbusier's ideas because they hated what Corbusier was saying in his urban proposals. They had a lot of problems with the Athens Charter as it was, they said, listen, Human experience is important. You can't do these maniacal, large-scale things. You can't destroy streets and replace them with motor cars. Uh, you need to, we need to produce cities that are, have architectural quality at every scale. And there are four scales of human association. The building scale, so if I had the slide, I'd be, I'm going to switch to the, the whiteboard here. What are the four scales of human association? It's the architectural scale at one end. My partner needed my idea, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, you're in trouble. Oh, great. <laughs> Tell her. I will. Um, so, there's the, there's the scale of the building at one end. <clears throat> and then there's the scale of the city at the other end. 
and there are two scales between those two. And the team 10 um, guys said, city, that's well in hand. There's a lot of people paying attention to the scale of the entire city. Would be the scale of the block. In this scale, architects, they're doing, they're killing it, right? Architects are on the job. But yeah, this scale is the scale of the district. And this scale is the scale of the street. And they said, we have a lot of really important job, a lot of work to do here and here. This is hard. This is more our style. Let's tackle this one. So Team 10 said, architects, let's deal with the scale of the street. It's time. Let's go to work. And so that's what they tackled. And that is the work that still needs to be done. And so that's the work that Jane Jacobs, Holly White, Kevin Lynch, and Jan Giel. That's how you say that, Jan Giel. Have you ever heard of Jan Giel? So all of this. You heard of Yangil? Um, he's what? Oh, yeah, in the um, table of contents. Yeah. Um, if you were to go to the internet and say, Secret life of small urban spaces. You would see, um, let's see what this one is. This is Bryant Park. Who's been to Bryant Park? Cool, right? It used to be, when I lived in New York, it was for buying pot, and that's all it was for. You did not go into Bryant Park unless you were buying or selling pot. There's a, that's a pop-up parking day lot. This is Times Square. So this is the legacy of, um, Holly White. His full name is William Hollingsworth White. Uh, like Jane Jacobs, he started out, uh, oh, that's the Naked Cowboy, he's famous. Um, Williams, William Hollingsworth White started out as a journalist working for Forbes magazine, uh, but now uh, he's better known as kind of a, a radical social scientist who uh, employed film uh, as a, a tool of analysis that, um, let's see if... We have this book in our school library. Oh, yes. It has 11 main points. I studied the triangulation idea last semester with Charles Mio. Yes, uh, Charlie would be the one. Um, let's see, let's get... He, he was forgotten for a while, and then uh, all of a sudden, he's back with a vengeance. Um, but in 1980, he wrote a book, and then made, and then, uh, oh, this is some student presentation on what, okay, this is the key segment of film. So out in front of the, of the Seagram Tower, he set up, uh, a camera, and he used cinematography, used a, a film camera with a clock to analyze human behavior. And this is where he, and then he created architectural drawings that uh, codified. He noticed that humans like to sit where the sun was shining. And uh, he actually documented how people moved according to where the sun was shining. 
and he quantified it through architectural drawings. He also looked at Wall Street. Um, he looked at men comparing golf swings. He looked at men uh, leering at the women walking by. Um, it was the 1980s. Um, the patterns of how we stand on the street to allow some people to walk by and stay out of their way. Um, he, he made um, speculations on uh, why people congregate where they congregate, why they go where they go, why they behave the way they behave. At this moment in time, it was, it was unprecedented to a large extent. And in the, the years that followed in the 80s and 90s, you really were, were not supposed to be interested in, um, in this type of research. Um, because architects were supposed to be uh, producing big, beautiful buildings uh, that carried metaphorical meanings. But we're not in that business anymore. We don't ask you to make big, beautiful buildings that are vehicles of metaphorical meaning. We're asking you, uh, what can architecture do and how can architecture do it? So we're back to understanding how humans engage with architecture and how architecture supports or uh, undermines the ability to treat, um, to foster certain outcomes. And Jan Giel is the inheritor of the science of studying how humans operate. The choices we make in public spaces, why why this happens, why that happens, how is it, they were back at Times Square, how is it that these formal spatial arrangements uh, yield these outcomes in terms of human experience on the streets? And this is suddenly, well, it seems sudden to me, there's Amsterdam. This suddenly, uh, in the past 20 years, has gone from being, you're not allowed to talk about this, to kind of the main task of architects is how do we build and design with human experience in mind so that we can support the most positive outcomes uh, that architecture can support. Architecture can't do it alone, but architects are obligated to read the world and what it has to offer us in terms of understanding of how humans experience the world. and from that interpretation of the world, identify opportunities for design uh, and designing according to those opportunities to try to create the most meaningful shift. Okay?